Hello everybody and welcome back to another one of those videos where I talk about updates on the Steam version of Dwarf Fortress coming from Toady1 and Kit Fox. We got a various number of blog posts as well as a kind of bonus on the future of the Fortress thing, follow up on keyboards from the last one of these. So. Before we dive in, I just want to say, if you don't want to hear the part where I read the posts, assuming you've already read all of the posts, click to hear. You still with us? All right, let's get started. So we start off with this post from Future of the Fortress, where Toady writes, Keyboard stuff. There was some confusion over the linked suggestions thread and above and elsewhere about hotkeys, etc. And generally... I should clarify the different pieces of the keyboard support and where we are at. For hotkeys, I'll have to move some of them, since I can't assume we have numpad and WASD has to camp out over on the left side of the keyboard forever. But hotkeys for opening and using menus seems pretty easy to support. We do have to show them to the player somehow. Tooltips are one typical way, and there could be some layer that draws them under buttons as well. I guess some games have done, like, holding alt for this kind of thing. For designations, I think WAS plus mouse combination can handle some things that people aren't giving it credit for, long tunnels, etc. And the camera keys also work for doing up and down staircases. But we've listened to the feedback here, and the cursor mode is easy to support since most of the code is sitting around for it and we already have cursor graphics we just have to make sure that new people don't get stuck in there for menu navigation missing the numpad and our old sometimes inconsistent and annoying methods of scrolling put us in a bind in some cases focus and button use etc probably can't be the same between various menus because they are quite different from each other though i think as with the classic display and adventure mode, the main issue here is time. I see the pathway through classic and adventure stuff though, so it's easy to commit to doing these in as a timely a fashion as possible after launch, if that's the way we go. With a few menus, I'm not sure how much work it'd take. We read through all of the comments and take them seriously, even the negative ones, so there's no need to be rude or assume the worst. We're going to try to address issues, and we think things are going to turn out well. But everything just takes time. And now we have a post from Zach, and he says, A game with this level of complexity can be confusing and overwhelming for the average gamer. It already has a reputation for being one of the most obtuse games ever created. And that ends here. As we go through the UI overhaul, we are adding short guides for crucial mechanics on top of the tooltips that are already there. These can be dismissed and disabled in order to not annoy, but we are on a mission. There are so many aspects of this game that are hidden inside menus or info screens. We're going to shed light on these tools and show the world the result of 20 plus years of work that they have only seen a glimpse of. These guides are only a tiny part of the time that we are spending on improvements, improvements that you made possible. Your generosity is being put to use, squishing some of the most important bugs that have dodged the project for years. And did we tell you we ran world gen on a laptop for 1000 years on a medium world and it only took 28 minutes previously that would have taken like four hours and lastly we have a post from tarn and he says the continuing efforts one side of it as we've mentioned is setting up the framework for further tutorials and instruction sheets and filling them with text another is fixing up bugs as they arise to keep the upcoming stage three manageable bug fixing and then there's the general approachability of the game, which is where stuff like world gen speed comes in. To make sure it, that it wasn't just reliant on necromancers killing the world, I ran a world without any of that. And a medium still only took 27 minutes. I noticed the world was infused with rocks, and people worshipped them, and they, as they tend to do when there's enough city attacks, but there wasn't any formal rock religions. Turns out Mega Beast Prophets weren't generating properly, so it's fixed now. And I ran another world after some hundreds of years. Somebody founded a bronze colossus worshipping monastery. They're reasonably rare, but it was wholesome to have them. As for the necromancers tending to kill off most of the worlds in their later years, we're still pondering that. Our planned solution for that was to have religions organize the destruction of the secret scrolls and keeping of forbidden slabs, and the rise of undead hunting, orders and such. 
but it's probably not best to start anything ambitious or prone to breakdowns at this stage, but we'll see what happens. Also, in the usability vein, I added in place and object lists, kind of analogous to previous rooms and treasure list buttons, but with categories and more information. So far, I've added done zones, stockpiles, locations, workshops, and farm plots in separate subtabs. And the objects are grouped as crafted artifacts, symbols of positions, and named objects and written content. This means that if you've misplaced your dump zone or a favorite stockpile, say, you won't have to look all over for it. You can just find it in a list and recenter. We've also extended the endgame and given it a bit of optional structure. On top of the underground rewrite we already mentioned, getting the monarch requires a certain baseline of happiness now. Once you get your monarch suited with proper rooms, it'll give you a little congratulatory message. And then the game gives you a more ambitious goal to become a true mountain home involving the underground and such. If you can do it, you're pretty good at the game. And it's not like it's arch crystal ambitious or uh, long death, but just a little taste. It doesn't kick you out for winning the game. Uh, see a much older version of Dwarf Fortress that literally did this, but it's good to continue to have something just as the goal of getting the Monarch or deeper treasures was there already as a previous form of victory. Now they are united somewhat. You can still get the Monarch early, if you know how, and go from there and get the rooms and do the ambitious things. So the first thing I really want to cover from these posts from them is this uh, article on Kotaku, actually, where they say it's time to help out Dwarf Fortress, which I think pushed a lot of positive traffic towards Zack and Tarn over the week uh, in the form of finances because they've been talking in a much more upbeat manner in these posts, and it's just really nice to see. So thanks, Kotaku, for that. It's very rare that I'll say nice things about Kotaku, but here we are. It's the year 2022, and I'm complimenting Kotaku. Moving forward, Future of the Fortress post, talking about controls. So Tarn essentially just states that mouse is the priority, right? And, like, I, I, I get that for premium. That's what you want. You want to be bringing new people into the game, and you want them to find the game approachable. But he also does cite that... We clearly made our feedback clear. You know, I guess enough of you guys, uh, myself included, sent off emails and posted on the on the forums and talked about it on the subreddit and on the Discord because there's lots of people uh, that have in like inflicted on Tarn our desire to keep some sort of uh, keyboard compatibility uh, to play to our fortress, even if it's like not the same control scheme. Like I don't care if the control scheme is the same, but. We want this. So even if we don't get it at launch, it does sound like it's it's definitely something that's back on their minds and they are thinking about it. And quite frankly for me, I if even if premium launches without pure keyboard support, the second it gets pure keyboard support, I, I will be back to rebinding everything onto my numpad and trying to just keep the controls the same. I mean, like, the the way a lot of those menus work right now is either uh, individual buttons are tied to hotkeys or you just scroll through it with plus and minus on the numpad. And, like, that is old school and nobody does that in modern game design. But if you know what buttons to hit in what order, things are so much faster than even using a mouse. And I know people don't believe me when I say that, but just look at StarCraft players and try and tell them to play their game only using a mouse. I'm not saying I have a bajillion actions per minute or anything. Thing, but I can play Dwarf Fortress pretty quick. And then Zach's post here, he talks a little bit about the complexity of the, of the game, tutorializing it and, and UI, which, you know, definitely something that they've been working on. I think that the the, tutor the video and tutorials that I put out the other day showing kind of those few released screens are pretty clear. And I, I think that people kind of appreciate what they're doing with the tutorialization. So that's fantastic. But then he mentions something at the, in the second half of this, which gets me really excited, which is the, oh, it a medium world for a thousand years only took 28 minutes. And Tarn follows up in the post right after. And then Tarn continues to talk about this uh, with, with his post, where he states that not only did world generation take less than 28 minutes, it took 27, but he did have to disable necromancers, which I would think would actually lower the frame rate on world generation because eventually kind of the undead takes over the entire world. There's an undead apocalypse, and then there's only just mindless zombies walking around, which don't take as mu don't cause as much interesting stuff to happen in the world. It's just brains, right? Uh, so there, because there's less brains in the world, there's less people thinking, and the, the game generates faster. Um, but it's fantastic to... to 
to hear one that world gen is going a lot quicker because a thousand years on a medium world on my computer would take a couple hours on a large world it would take upwards of six to ten like it's really nice that <laughs> that that's faster uh and but then he goes on to talk about a bug that he fixed uh with um mega beast worshiping which is cool because i never actually saw them very often like almost never especially recently, so it's good that that got fixed. The next thing in this that I really want to kind of highlight is the usability vein bit that he mentions at the bottom half of this post, where he says, I added a, a, in place an object list of analogous to the previous rooms menu and treasure buttons, but with categories. So essentially, like, the fact that we'll be able to just, like, select a stockpile by just going down a list, that is lovely. And just, like, go through everything and just jump spike to it, because, like, there are ways to sort of do that, but the old stock, like, I, I'm generally a defender of classic Dwarf Fortress UI. I don't think it's as bad as people say it is. But the old stock screen made no logical fucking sense and took a billion years to search through. So the fact that we can just, like, jump to something in the, in the world is very exciting to me. Now, this last little bit I'm a little iffy on, but it's not actually changing anything from what I can tell. It's just adding in, ma making it clear what's happening. Like... So he, he talks about giving the end game a bit of like optional structure. So like once you have a monarch, which is like a, you know, a king or a queen in your fort, uh, you can become a true mountain home and there's like optional objectives to get that. These things are already in the game from what I can tell. They're just not signposted anywhere, right? So like the when you first uh, embark, it'll it'll you, you start off as a group, then you move into a town and a village or a village and then a town and then um, a fortress and then a mountain home, right? So like the, the name of your fort does change kind of in one screen, but it doesn't signpost that. It doesn't tell you how you actually achieve that. And it doesn't tell you how you go about growing this. I think this is cool. I think that um, adding a little bit more structure to Dwarf Fortress is maybe better for people who are more used to a RimWorldy type thing because RimWorld is like, it's all about the structure really. Um, but like this, I, I, I'm a little iffy on this because like I, I, I'm a role player. I like to just mess around and like watch things happen and not think too hard about strategy and goals if that makes sense so um I, I don't know how many people play the game like that and how many people are much more um min maxi and numbers based i, I know that people like my friend tech could je definitely uh like the numbers in their dwarven it, it banter and events but uh, for me I, i'm much more a um kind of let's just watch people have cool times and tell cool stories and have fun if you enjoyed this video, let me know what you thought about, like, these changes. I think that that performance increase on world generation is fantastic. Very excited for that. And also, uh, the end game kind of stuff is kind of neat. Kind of neat indeed. And it's nice to hear about keyboards. And thank you very much, Kotaku. If you want to support this video or myself directly, you can do that via super thanks in the comments section or uh, via my Patreon, patreon.com slash B-L-I-N-D-I-R-L, where you can support these videos and help me do this. Uh, next week, not this current week, but next week, there will be some scattery bits to do with news because I'm going to be on vacation. I'm going to be in Quebec for a week visiting my little sister so uh when i when i get back there will be kind of a big dump of everything all at once and then things will go back to normal after that but there will be kind of maybe a, a gap in news so if i'm like four days late on the next one i'm sorry